some news that has been happening this month. This comes from the LF Research and Digital Group and the community behind pulled together a great report on the business value of OSPOS, how to measure the value of the OSPO, why are OSPOS being created, why are OSPOS being sustained and nurtured. So this report provides great insights. If you would like to learn more, go and check it out. It's already live in the LF Research page. Tito Group has been organizing the OSPO survey since 2018. And we tried to get the pulse on the status of OSPOs worldwide. We have opened a call for partners, foundations, new projects, new organizations willing that are helping OSPOs or the OSPO movement to grow and would like to take part of this initiative this year. GitHub just announced that they open-sourced their OSPO policies and guides, and it's available in their GitHub, GitHub OSPO, and everyone can have access to that. And from the public sector also, and in Europe, great initiative, the European Commission OSPO created this open source governance guide, and they're serving links, white papers, guides related to OSPOs in the public sector, a place where people can, can go and check this OSPO model of governance under the public sphere. There are more news, but we don't have enough time. We try to pull all that together from different open source and OSPO communities in the OSPO news. There's a in case you miss it, industry news and articles, like for instance, regarding the OSPO mind map, OSPO plus plus created and university open source program office guides, which is great. So you can go and check it out as well there. Spology, it's more than just a webinar. We have a full repo where we try to pull together great resources to help organizations get started into OSPOS. And we welcome new contributors, non-coders, but also coders. We also have regional meetings in Europe, in Asia. We have some artifacts like the OSPO movement project, the OSPO model, OSPO news. There are different ways you can contribute and you can get started. So I just wanted to give a big kudos to the OSPO local communities that are being formed in Japan and in Finland. And we put all this into the Ospology YouTube channel. So saying that, let's move to the topic of the month. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And uh, thank you so much for inviting us all here today. Um, we're, I'm delighted to be part of this discussion around transitioning, um, uh, transition paths for open source and regulated environments. Um, and I think we'll start with um, maybe a round of introductions. And I'm going to ask our panelists that if when they're giving their introduction to themselves, maybe have a little comment about um, your own participation um, in the open source ecosystem, um, the kind of environment that you're currently operating in and what challenges very briefly you might see in terms of actually bringing open source into that environment. So um, maybe I'll start. Remy, would, would you like to get kicked started, please? Sure. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Ospology community for having me. Uh, my name is Remy DeCosmaker. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm the open source lead here at the Digital Service at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS.gov. Uh, the Digital Service works to transform the U.S. healthcare system by improving the design of healthcare experiences, delivering value to government providers and patients, modernizing systems, and participating in policy development. And we accomplish this by deploying small responsive groups of designers, engineers, and product managers within CMS on a tour of duty model to work alongside civil servants. And these multidisciplinary teams help to bring best practices and new approaches to support government modernization and solve some of the most complex problems facing our healthcare system today in the United States. Uh, we have over 150 million users that depend on the code that we steward at CMS. And to address these problems, we're going to need all the help that we can get. So um, a little disclaimer, of course, standard procedure. Uh, the views represented here today are those of the speaker and do not represent those of views of CMS, its components, or any other components of the United States federal government. And I'll also add that I am not a lawyer or an accountant, and this isn't legal or financial advice. And I will pass it back to you, Claire. Thank you so much, Remy. If we if we ever need an indication we're in a regulated environment, I think that might the disclaimers. <laughs> like, but thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, great to hear where where you're where you're coming from. Um, so going in an in a clockwise motion around my screen. Um, Thomas, can I call on you, perhaps to give a little introduction, please? My name is uh, Thomas Sinorgan. 
Uh, I lead the open source program office at EPAM and I help variety organizations uh, from the public sector to automotive to telecom to high machinery companies uh, work with open source and I'm highly active in the open source community here in the, uh, the do group in the uh, being part of the steering committee. Uh, I'm also in, involved in OpenSSF, uh, also involved in uh, OpenChain um, and really just Google my name and you'll find out that I have like nine other open source projects in uh, that I'm basically trying. I mostly work on, on like help organizations with their open source governance and I work a lot of work on like open source, what I call open source supply chain security, although I don't necessarily agree that we have an open source supply chain, but that's a whole other discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. I'm sure we'll come back to that later. S-bombs and things, very popular topic uh, when it comes to governance. So, Morris, would you like to give yourself a little introduction, please? I'm... Uh... A strategic policymaker on open source for the city of Amsterdam. Uh, I have a background in uh, IT and social science, bridging the gap between social and technical challenges, bridging uh, between social and technical challenges. The, the difficult part is that government, the city of Amsterdam especially, has the biggest set of developers in house, but we're not an IT service provider as a government. So, how do you get into the right balance between developing your own software? not competing with markets, being within law, regulated environments, competition law, and all kinds of difficult lawyer stuff. I'm not a lawyer. I do have a lot of <laughs> knowledge around it. So that's it. Thank you so much. Nico, would you like to give a little introduction, please? Yeah, I have a similar overlap with uh, the topics addressed here. Uh, I work as an open source ambassador at the OSPO of Alliander. And we are one of the three major grid operators in the Netherlands. So we distribute to about a third of the households uh, of the Netherlands electricity and gas, also to, to companies. And the energy industry, of course, goes way back. And also uh, the, the regulation uh, is similar. We act as sort of a private company, but uh, we are not an energy company that has been separated in the Netherlands. So the energy and the distribution origin, we are owned by municipalities and by provinces, but we don't have to meet all the, the regulation. But of course, companies Petition law, dealing with procurement, those kinds of aspects are really uh, important for us. And also, yeah, they reflect on the, the challenges we have as an OSPO. Thank you, Nico. And as Anna mentioned, my name is Claire Dillon. Um, I'm the Executive Director of InnerSource Commons. And for those of you who may not be familiar with InnerSource, it's the practice of using open source methods and bringing the open source culture into organizations for collaboration behind the firewall. Um, and oftentimes, inner source is used as a step on the path to transitioning to an open source culture. So it's one of the reasons why we're particularly also interested in this topic. And in particular, in this area of regulated environments, where I think everyone, it's a challenge for everyone to move to an open source culture. But in this regulated environment, it seems like there are additional challenges at play. And you've heard a little bit about some of those here today, even in the introductions around the legal procurement areas. But I'm going to do, let's do another round to hear a little bit more about the very specific challenges that you all see as we're bringing open source into the mix um, in your organizations. Because I'm assuming that particular scenario, it can be challenging in your organizations for the reasons of, of regulation and things like that. So. Maybe we do another round. Remy, would you like to talk specifically about that idea of bringing open source in? It's obvious you want loads of people to help you build out your, you know, solve the challenges you're facing. But what what's what's what are the challenges to do, making that happen? I think I sort of put, you know, four sort of areas of, of major challenges right now. I'm still in my first year, so the challenges are still presenting themselves to me and I'm still finding new ones as I continue to learn more about the public sector. But right now they sort of fall into challenges of scale challenges complexity, legacy, and procurement. Uh, you can't really have a government panel without talking about challenges of procurement. So with scale, you know, the federal government is the largest employer in the United States. And just within CMS, we have thousands of employees and tens of thousands of government contractors, numerous optives or operational divisions, and the complexity of dealing with that, unlike some of the other OSPOs that I've been involved in in the past, as we build out our open source program, and we are still in the early stages of doing that, usually it's one organization that's focused on a limited number of projects or a major website or a set of major clients. But we have our home agency of health and human services. Then we have the center for Medicare and Medicaid studies, then the office of administrator, then the digital service, and then our team, the open source team, and then individual project teams. So there's just many layers. And within each of those layers, there are 
each of their own cultures around infrastructure or best practices. Each group might have their own policies. The Health and Human Services Department has its own open source policy. CMS has an open source policy. Our team has an open source policy. Each of these nesting groups all inherit from each other and making sure that you understand all of the layers of federal policy that go into it as well. Highly regulated is a good word for it. We have regulations like the Paperwork Reduction Act and other interesting pieces of legislation that require that when you're dealing with the public or gathering information that you take certain, you follow certain rules to do that. So complexity is a huge one. And then procurement, I can just like say procurement and I think everybody gets it. It's very different working in the public sector for procurement than it is in the private sector. I will just add that there was one procurement off this often in times when in previous OSPOs and here inside the government, there are a variety of procurement offices. So it's not just one. And then legacy is the last thing. So uh, some of the code that we run has been in production for over 50 years. I mean, some of our friends on the power grid can probably appreciate that statement, but there is some, when we say legacy, it is very legacy. So, you know, modernization is a huge challenge where you have to balance stability and backwards compatibility with critical features and infrastructure. So those are some interesting challenges. Um, and then I'll just throw in an extra one of hiring. Oftentimes the public sector is not as competitive in a, you know, from a salary standpoint or from some of the perks and benefits standpoints, the process might take longer. So these are areas where the digital service and the United States digital service are really working to help to improve that process so it's easier for people to get in and easier for us to hire subject matter experts in the areas where they can do the most good. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Well, that's getting us started, but it sounds, it sounds like we may not get to be exhaustive about all the challenges in, the, in this conversation. Um, and certainly we probably won't be focusing on procurement because that's been covered in, in detail in terms of what that challenge might be in public sector. Um, but but I do think, um, it, you know, I, maybe I'll go to Maris next to see if if your experiences on the other side of the water, shall we say, um, it, are similar. Um, are there additional challenges you would like to also identify? Um, or are you facing the same set that Remy might be uh, have identified? It, it, it overlaps. What I what I wanted to add is more on the uh, on the policy side and the strategic policy side. I, I work closely to this, the CIOs and uh, the staff, and you will hear a lot of what you see on the floor. The people, developers, the project leads, they all want to do open source, and even our our ministries. Our ministers do want to go open source, but in the in the middle layer, management takes a step back. And what you see from a policy side of things is when I try to provide them the metrics, I can't because there aren't any metrics. We don't have a clue. I, I will take an example for in procurement. For we had a we wanted to develop a new farm for the city of Amsterdam, and it was a very clear message. So we did the farm just clo closed source farm, not reusable for other stuff. Was half the price. For the sound that it would, if you were to be able to reuse it and have the intellectual property, blah blah. But for your salaries, we don't ask. Okay, okay this is this is a software A. It will cost this much. This is software B. It's open source. You have intellectual property rights, or we have to do these kinds of stuff developments to make it fit all kinds of stuff we don't ask in our procurement so in the end, you don't have metrics to present to management. This is what it's takes or this is what it will cost to do open source, does that compete with the values we as a government want to follow? Is it worth the money? So the, when I started I doing this two years and the first two years were just about where the hell can I get my metric or how do I, how, how can I get a start in collecting metrics that aren't even there yet? One of the main challenges. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, maybe we'll come to you next, Nico, and um, was referred to about the, the idea of legacy code and indeed folks that are involved in the energy system are, are been around for a long time. So, um, and also maybe we'll start to move into maybe ways in which OSPOs can actually help address some of the many challenges we've already identified as well. But any thoughts from you around what, again, challenges you might see, but indeed how and why your OSPO has been created to maybe address some of them. Yeah, certainly. And to, to put it in perspective, maybe we jokingly call our, our grid the museum. Because if you go to certain stations, you, you'll find automation and technologies that goes back to the 80s. Uh, and it's still operational, right? Especially the, um, the, the, the physical hardware often is mechanical. So you can easily replace things. We have our own workshop so we can make modifications. And what you see now is with the transition to more and more software, this becomes harder. So now with procurement, we have to take the mindset of the past where we say, of course, if the vendor stops supporting it, 
we can if it's in a small number we can support it ourselves or find another vendor we have to apply that same mindset to uh, upcoming procurements and this is something we are now moving with smart meter uh, procurement for example uh, we are taking that mindset to say like it's not just about this specific hardware but we want it to be modular and we want to be able to to run software update and even if the supplier uh, stops supporting it for whatever reason that we at least have the opportunity to continue the lifetime for smart meters if we have to go around all the households and this is something that we're doing with uh, the phase out of the gprs communication right this is a technology advancement so we, we're changing the communication uh, of, of smart meter rollout but that means that electric engineers have to go around each and every house to replace a physical device it's if skilled labor ideally we want to make things modular and updatable yeah that's i see where open source uh, really fits in and it's our task as as an ospo i think to work with the teams that are uh, working on those solutions whether it's procurement or something homegrown to make sure that this is guaranteed okay so that sustainability aspect particularly in public sector i'm guessing is it becomes even more important than it might in a corporate environment um, and then being able to do that in a consistent way which i hear from both Remy and Maurice, that but that it's very challenging in public sector organizations to even be able to get that consistency of approach based on how things have been happening in the past. So tell us, you, you've been working with many such organizations. Can you too talk to what you see the role of the OSPO in and maybe being able to address some of these challenges that we've identified? First thing I would say, be more, be, really act as a counselor. That's really what I, what I see common, again, there are not generalized, but there are some mistakes that I often see like, oh, we have to start an OSPO. And they, they get a person in place and say like, oh, that's going to lead the OSPO. And then I'm like, uh, no, no, like, like, do you actually have a community of practice? So for, for people who haven't seen it, Anna did recently at uh, Falls Backstage a nice talk that's recorded on YouTube where she starts actually like their minimal viable OSPO. Start with a community of practice, finding people that are actually interested in, in, in actually in the open source within the organization through all the various sectors, but it's not even like I work a lot, uh, I work in public sector, I work in automotive, I work in financial services. It sometimes actually doesn't matter. I sometimes compare organizations to like island states where they're like thousands of little islands. Technically they're all part of the same country, but they're all island states. And you as an OSPO, your first basically is kind of get in a little rowing boat and row from one island to the, uh, to the other island and start making friends and finding out who's your first, like who can be part of your community. And, and like not even announce that you're gonna do an OSPO, just making friends and making, ma making that network happen. And then you feel like, okay, these and these people, cause you need Lily ambassadors in every island that you can, can, can work with. That's usually my first time. And then like, like, and that's where I see common mistake. We're like, oh, we start an OSPO and then you get into what well, Maurice says, like, okay, we need to do metrics, we have KPIs, and it's all about, like, no, it's not about cost savings, KPIs. It's like, what can you do if you have all of your organization, whether it's public sector or commercial, working together to basically help you stay ahead of the curve, deliver new services, whatever you're doing. That's the that's the real value. And that you can't do that with a vendor or within. It's like, what if you actually better leverage the people that you already have? So I love that. So 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 we can add now to the list of potential roles within an OSPO, the idea of a counselor slash island hopping ambassador, um, which which I, I particularly like. <laughs> and uh, um, and thanks for that addition, Thomas, because I mean, I think when you have that centralized OSPO function, whether it be a formal OSPO or a minimal viable OSPO, we'll come to Anna to, to input on that. Um, uh, it, it seems like that those creating those relationships and kind of getting people on side, particularly in a regulated environment, may help with the fact that it's it's such a formal environment to be working in. And I, I know you you're you're both you're both the expert on the minimum viable OSPO and keeping an eye on other chat channels. So would you like to like to come in with a question? Now that you were mentioning the seller and so on, in the last report, like one session called the different hats on the OSPO. And when you are working in an OSPO, you are doing like consular work facilitating work to all the, the other teams and also having this sustainability mindset on it's not just about how organizations can use open source but also how to give back to open source and how to educate those people into how to apply open source best practices and, and that just remind me to what inner source usually helps with this internal education so i uh, ask you clearly what what are your thoughts on this first stage 
on these environments that needs like previous educations or maybe like where open source is not as clear as maybe traditional IT service companies. I think it's really interesting because um, so first first of all, this this idea that sometimes and as people have pointed out here, even the bringing up the topic of open source can kind of trigger some of these uh, regulations that are related to legal or procurement or other things. So sometimes even the, the, the concept of open source being introduced can maybe tr trigger a lot of challenges um, that, that you do have to overcome at some point, but there are other challenges that you can perhaps ch address through inner source before you trigger those additional challenges. So it's kind of like, you know, biting off as much as you can chew on the way. So inner source in a sense, in essence, helps or allows, I suppose, folks to maybe be able to do some of the education around the behaviors that are needed and the reasons for collaboration without going the full journey in terms of actually addressing all the things that would need to be put in place to actually make something open source. And um, so I suppose th that would be my view on it. But I but I'm interested to hear for others when you take all those challenges that are kind of laid out in front of us now, like in terms of it's pretty clear that the OSPO has the, the potential to be this centralized function within an organization to be able to help with having consistency, being able to identify the blockers and being able to bring people together through ambassador relation to maybe problem solve where if everyone was doing it in silos, they'd never get to a consistent way of doing things. Um, so, so I'm interested now as well for folks that are like actively doing this, you know, we've listed off many of those challenges. We've talked about the cultural side of things, building relationships, legal procurement, all the various, you know, challenges that are out there, metrics, how you measure this, um, convincing middle management and education, so much to do for, for what might be a small set of resources. So how do you prioritize or how do you even break down that huge long set of challenges? How do you deal with that in your OSPO? How, how do you, how do you address that? So how do you prioritize? Remy, you're nodding there. Would you like to, 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 to come in and give us a, an example of how it's done in CMS? Not just at CMS, but in any OSPO. And there's lots of wonderful literature out there from the to-do group talking about sort of prioritization and stakeholder. And your structure of your OSPO really dictates a lot of what your priorities look like. So depending on what part of the organization you answer into, those may or may not be a higher priority for some organizations than others. When I was in the private sector, a big part of an OSPO was about outbound, right? So how do we get out the engineering excellence and convey, you know, the best practices that we're doing the latest and greatest things. Inside of a highly regulated environment, I would say that inbound is a much more important aspect. And we spend a lot of time talking about software build materials and software supply chain assurance and a lot of the new executive orders that have just come out. It really depends on where you are in the organization, what your goals of your organization are and being responsive to those. You know, I come in with a lot of preconceived notions because I've gotten, you know, had the privilege of working in a few open source program offices throughout the history of sort of the evolution and really being open to listening to your users and listening to your stakeholders and partnering with the leaders who are already there like Thomas was talking about. You know, your job is to elevate the leaders within the group just as much as it is for you to bring the best practices. And the other thing I will add quickly is just that no matter where you go, there are never enough people to do all of the work that needs to be done and it is always just a prioritization uh, reshuffling all the time. So in an OSPO, good to have a policy that says you should do this. It's better to have an example that shows how to do it. And it's even better than that to have a pull request ready that changes that piece of code to actually be implementable. And it's the best when it's automated so that it automatically happens. So the more that you can remove Friction is good, and the more that you can take the compliance and the policy functions and turn them into automated things that take things off of people's plates so they can focus on delivering value in their project or their vertical, the more effective your OSPO tends to be. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Remy. Um, Thomas, um, did you want to come in there? I saw you raise your hand there. Yeah, since Remy mentioned uh, software bill of materials, and so another highly regulated industry that I'm involved in, or I have a large list, is automotive. And of course, we have to do... Uh, Cars can kill you if the software doesn't fu function properly. So there's a big effort on, uh, on the go to make software build materials, but there's a lot of legacy software in there as well. What I, I've been advocating is like when I started originally, like years ago, working my, 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 my OSPO, uh, my previous employer, what I see is it's a habit of everybody doing things by themselves. And 
you'd be surprised actually how open your other OSPO. So I work on a daily basis with several other OSPOs to develop software together to do our whole automation, inner source compliance, inner source, like on a daily basis. So even if you have a very small team, you'll be surprised that your fellow OSPOs will probably have similar challenges. And so this will happen to how we got actually the to do of Europe actually going. Uh, it was basically, we, we just stumbled upon other OSPOs and we were like, oh, hang on, we have this, sim yeah, not everything, but that's 70, 80% was some overlap. And then we're like, actually, why don't we do divide and conquer? And that's how we basically took the, this huge set of challenges. And then it was like, okay, if you guys can focus on the security bit, we're going to look on this, how we do this whole compliance thing in CICD bit. And that's how we basically did the divide and conquer. And and so, yeah, when you have this low list, make your priorities as Remy said, but also look like, what should we do ourselves? What can I do with the community already together? I, I see uh, Remy shared all the repo linter lint. I can do better because we're replacing, I'm, I'm working on a replacement for repo linter. So we already have a better tool for you. Ort can do this now as well. Uh, look at, look yeah. at the collaboration happening live. I love us. <laughs> yeah, so so basically, yeah, I work together on, on a daily basis with, with several other OSPOs really to scale my OSPO. I don't have a big OSPO. I have the same problems there, but I work in that for various in high, highly regulated environments. We, we need to have a solution that 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 works. So and especially in, in the public sector we're running like yeah procurement of a tool is so freaking complicated. But if the tool happens to be open source, oh that was no problem whatsoever and they could instantly uh, uh instantly instantly use it. And this is how we bypass some of these procurement hurdles where it's like, yeah, we can start right away and we just use whatever platform they already have. Fortunately in government, it's usually very old stuff. And then it's like head scratching to be like, okay, yeah, technically we should be able to get it to run. Um, but yeah, that, that's usually, with, especially like with the whole highly regulated things, there's more and more regulation. So funny enough, I've always thought that, that the government and other highly regulated would have more things in place compared to the, like the regular commercial side. And that's the commercial side, but I, I'm actually surprised how, in some ways, some things are so much more paper-based in 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 in, in, in the high logger in a sense that like actually the jump is actually much more bigger to do to do the modern stuff because they have paper-based processes that first need to digitalize before they can. It, it has a pros and cons. Based on one side, they have nothing, so you can quickly build things up to basically what is the the most modern uh, standard. On the other side, you're going from paper-based process to a digital process. And that means convincing a lot of people and a lot of people will be afraid. So uh, like Claire, you mentioned in the, the scarf like uh, principle and your talk recently, like, yeah, that, that like people are really afraid when you basically take away the paper from them and we're going to digitize this and they're afraid that they'll lose their job. In, in reality, we're actually, once you get ahead of them, we're moving their actual job to do much more interesting things and, and better things. But again, they're so used to, this is what I know. And they're, so you have to be careful when you introduce things to introduce them step by step, group by group, instead of doing these wide announcements. Again, make friends in different islands from island to island. So what I'm hearing is that, so number one, the, the folks in and the OSPOs are excellent collaborators that we should all be leveraging the fact to actually collaborate more, not just on the software, but also on the kind of ways to engage and convince people because some of those challenges may be common across the organizations. Um, and I see Anna, you've got your hand up. Do you have another comment or question that you'd like to add in? Someone just dropped a question. So Alex says, my OSPO is uh, 40 people that, but I built it the opposite way that you will are describing. Instead of proving the case from within, I built the team on the outside of the company and moved inward. Is this opposite approach anything that any of you have considered to relieve yourself of the immediate regulatory difficulties? Maybe I can respond to that with, with some additions to when I'm done answering. Uh, to Thomas, what we have in Amsterdam is that we started off exactly as I think Remy to, uh, described. So the biggest open source projects in the Netherlands uh, came from Amsterdam uh, called Signala Open Stats. The, the, the problem was as soon as we started collaboration, collaborate, collaborating with others, we noticed that others weren't at the same scale as Amsterdam to, to get an even playing field. And they soon started into a, uh, getting into users. So not contributors, but just users of the software. So what, what that 
turned into is that in the end, we had a vendor log in and the defender was Amsterdam. So all kinds of users were using the open source software in Amsterdam, but there's just one of them was managing uh, the, the whole the whole stuff. We discussed the, the, this. This is a topic that we discuss a lot in the Netherlands, also with Nico and others. Where do we land our open source products? We're not an IT service provider, so we don't want to have to the, the government we want to have the governance around software. It's not our, not what we do, but where do we land it? We don't know. We still don't know where to land our stuff. So, and, and that's, that's a funny thing. So if, if you're in a regulated environment, start off by just doing, you, you eventually all of them will get to the same boundaries where these governance issues will arise and where it will conflict with your core principles of what a government is so oh, just developing for yourself without getting on the market or just implementing open source software just for yourself is all fine but as soon as you're trying to get a and get past your own boundaries as a municipality or a government you get in all kinds of other questions that that's that would be at least my answer i, I do have some other stuff on, on what thomas said but let's first take this question well thank you and nico i think you want to come in on that yeah i, I really want to underline what uh, maurice is saying because what i i see is as we're bound by regulation and we have to meet specific goals i see we, we collaborate with other grid operators and of course with with universities and suppliers to come up with open source solutions that meet a specific need we're having um i think the challenge is how do you will give that a longevity and it's not just uh, the participants that kicked it off and I think in our case we were quite successful in that we had multiple parties that compared to municipality had proper development capacity so could actually uh, uh, move things forward but what if I don't know 10 other grid operators internationally join I think to a certain point you need the consultancy around it you need other uh, companies to, to to join in and scale it up because otherwise it's like Oh, fine that you want to join, but here's the documentation and uh, yeah, you're on your own in, when it comes to implementation. I think for now, the, the, the challenge, and I also see that with procurement, is you can you can ask the question for procurement, but then even if, if the software is out there, then oftentimes uh, I see there's not the company, there's no company uh, procuring on that software. Ideally, I want, I want uh, that will be a good good fit for a software but there's no uh, organization that is uh, no company that is uh, skilled with a software and and will be able to procure and and meet other requirements and so uh, even if uh, yeah and and uh, so you can also relate that then to uh, scaling up an open source project and uh, so I think that's also uh, a challenge to, to get longevity in projects so then taking that particular topic because it does seem to be one of the one of the differences, the points of difference between, say, a closed source proprietary solution that you could procure easily and, and but this idea of whose job is it to maintain it over time? And if, it, if it's yours, uh, if it's if it's built within a public sector organization, you know, are they really set up to A, do it for the long term, B, like sustain it for other people's use, not mind their own uh, organization's use, but perhaps other um, cities, perhaps other nationalities and other organizations. I, I would imagine that public sector organizations don't necessarily have the remit to be responsible for that level of maintenance, sustainability and all the rest of it. So taking that into account and, and, and maybe does anyone have perhaps some patterns of how that can be done in a sustainable fashion or how you imagine it should be done to actually make that easier? Because I, I do imagine that, that, that it can be quite difficult if you're just assuming that the organization itself has that responsibility over time and it, that might not be the sustainable solution. I would like to respond to that. The, 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 the whole thing, and that I, I think that's a major difference between the, the private sector, is that public sector is solely, solely interested in functionality. It mm -hmm. should work. We're not interested in intellectual property rights. We're not interested in any rights at all. It should just work. So as soon, for in the case of Amsterdam, we build something, it works, and we're, we're, we're shouting out, who wants to have it? We don't want it anymore. It's ours. We do we do have the rights around it, but we don't care about the rights. The rights are actually holding us back to get things going. And we discussed it, for example, the, around the energy sector. You have the Lin the the the, the LF Energy, the Linux Foundation is is governing the the collaboration a lot. We've we've been discussing should there any should there be a governance like the Eclipse Foundation, the Apache Foundation, maybe something specific for governments. There was something on the Slack. 
recently gets that maybe as a solution for for governments you, you want to be able to give away the software project and that you as remy said can just lean back and only do pull requests for that functionality that you need for your own situation or even have a four line round just to 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 do the specific stuff for your own contribute to a to a master to a main branch or something but we don't want to write that's 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 essentially the issue and there's not there's nothing to give it away to thomas i see you putting your hand up there would you like to come in on that yeah so this is the the, the, the funny thing what i will see between the public sector and my other clients well it's actually on both sides where like remy and i have a long time open source also like throwing over the soft open source over the wall and it's like oh, a year ago catch it and we're done with it we're hands off is really really frowned upon and i know pretty much remy and i if we run our own post we'd be like uh like no <laughs> And that's why I'm just looking at like, okay, because I see like a lot of this like high record, they're, they're not naturally software organization. They're, they're, they're used to buying things in and that's what they, that, that's their, their default. And, and, and so whether it's or like a public sector or in automotive or in telecom or financial services, the default mode is we buy something in and when we buy something in, we spend money and that's where the maintenance, but then they run into problems now like, oh we need to do kind of like ecosystem level changes where it's not just one bit of it. No, 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 no. We need to hell energy grid to be renewable or we need all self-driving cars or we, we will want to empower uh, uh, our citizens to do, be able to do more things digitally. And this is where the whole model basically rumbles down because, oh, there is not one vendor that we can get to, to do that for us. And that's where open source then plays in. But then they're like, oh, but hang on, who is going to support this and then you get this and again i will not name it but i have i'm based in germany there are some projects where they then try to build consortia with commercial uh partners to get it from from the going but that's where you see again the the lack of open source experience popping up because they have not been doing it in the public sector and how to run this kind of projects i'll have to interrupt i i feel like we're just getting hot hot up the conversation is just actually you know getting to the point and i see anna putting up her hand saying i think we might be out of time um, so, I mean, one final comment for me is that from this conversation, it's pretty obvious that the OSPOs in all of these organizations have a key role to play in terms of helping with scale, consistency, approaches to the legacy issue and, and all of the other, even how you might deal with procurement. I think we're all against islands. That's pretty clear, Thomas. And we're all, we all should be doing more island hopping and, and, and ambassadorial outreach. But it does sound like the conversation about how to make the open source system sustainable in the long term um you know even from between the public sector and commercial sector what role everyone has to play might be a topic for another day anna i'll hand it back to you but it sounds like we need a follow-on thank you so much claire for moderating this great panel thanks you maurice Nico, remy thomas saying that i hope you have a great evening if you're in europe night if you're in asia morning if you are in americas and hope to see you in the next following meeting